Thank you very much for joining uh, CIP Mini Summit Europe. Uh, this is the third uh, Mini Summit. Uh, we are very uh, pleased to have uh, this uh, yeah, Mini Summit for this time. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, maybe I, ne I need to uh, mute. Uh, so, the first uh, presentation uh, will be a set of civil infrastructure platform uh, by Urs Graham from Siemens and Yosaki Kobayashi from Toshiba. So, Urs, uh, please start your presentation. Okay, thank you, Yoshi. Um, yes, uh, as always, we start for the people who are new uh, to this topic uh, with a short introduction, what is a civil infrastructure platform? And um, yeah, maybe, Yoshi, can you go to the next slide or should I take over sharing? Okay. Um, yeah, we have some trends uh, in industry and also in what we call civil infrastructure, which is all the systems keeping our uh, systems for life, our civil systems like power and water and transportation up and running. And um, can you move on? Next slide. So uh, what, what, what we see uh, around us is uh, that things get smarter. That means they get processes integrated, but also they get connected. And uh, they are connected among each other and connected to the internet. And that's not only in this obvious cases like the connected cars, if you look at car sharing uh, offers, uh, it's also in systems which are not so visible. So in the uh, production uh, of uh, factories and, and uh, also in uh, systems uh, who make our city smart. That means um, we make the, the traffic control more intelligent. We have new transportation um, ideas which are possible with this. Energy management is optimized and so forth. Next slide. Yeah, and uh, maybe just click through the animation. So this is just a few examples of the systems we don't see every day. And um, they are really running 24 seven for the whole year. And uh, some of these systems are really at critical places. So we need to ensure that they are up and running. And um, yeah, because of this uh, special, um, uh, purpose of these systems, um, we, have, we have some certain requirements. If, if we compare this to the home automation and more consumer oriented systems, um, these systems have uh, differences compared to that world. On the next slide, uh, we see then uh, that, uh, just, just open the, the next animation, so one more click. Um, that things get much more complex in, in, in this area. So uh, if, if you look at what we know, so we know our smartphones and we know our home automation things, uh, which are basically one-to-one uh, -one connections of one device to cloud services. Um, in, in the systems we are talking about, uh, we have much more systems interacting. We have uh, higher hierarchies of, of, of systems. Uh, and as, as I already mentioned, these systems have to uh, have to be robust and uh, up and running all the time. And we have other non-functional requirements like real-time requirements, for example. We need guaranteed latencies for some tasks. Uh, we have guarantees of throughput and uh, responsiveness. And uh, so that's why companies like the companies who are running CIP 
um, are really interested in uh, focusing on that topics, which are not addressed by the typical commodity and uh, consumer uh, technologies at the moment. Let's go to the next slide. So there we see that uh, one of these aspects is uh, that these systems live really long. So this is maybe an extreme example, but a power plant uh, runs for 25 to 60 years uh, and has to be maintained for that time. So, uh, and uh, a special um, thing in this platforms is that we uh, cannot update things and always run the latest and greatest uh, uh, software version so um, because there is certification behind and there's a huge amount of tests and and uh, verifications uh, done uh, to to guarantee the robustness of these systems so that means that uh, people running these systems and now we are coming back to um, to our basic uh, topic, which is Linux as an operating system, uh, they cannot uh, update the operating system every, every few years. So they want to run a certain version as long as possible. This means uh, this version has to be maintained for quite a long time. Maybe not for 25 and not for 60 years, uh, but we are definitely not changing the operating systems uh, every two, three, four years uh, in these kinds of systems. Next slide, please. Yes, I said everything gets connected. Uh, this imposes new um, risks in terms of security. So um, we have to ensure that all our devices are secure. And uh, this, in most cases, means that we have uh, to be able to update things online. And um, so uh, we, we have to maintain these security holes uh, because these systems are reachable now. Uh, and we have to uh, be able to do the firmware updates of all these devices. And um, this in older systems was just not a topic because there was no network connection. So the only way to access the system was to drive by and to have physical access to the system. Next slide, please. Yes, and this summary is uh, the special requirements of, of the products uh, we have in our company. So they are industrial grade. This means we have non-functional requirements like reliability, functional safety, real-time capabilities. We have these long running systems. Uh, so uh, we need to guarantee the maintenance for the whole lifetime. And connected to this, we have to ensure that these systems are secure, especially if they are placed at critical spots in our infrastructure. And um, next slide, please. Now the question is how to solve this. Uh, uh, and uh, there's another trend going on. And uh, even in those companies, uh, we are using a lot more commodity software as a couple of years ago. And we are focusing basically on the domain specific applications on top, but the software stack underneath gets bigger and bigger. And uh, most of it is open source today. And uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, the many projects do not address these uh, civil infrastructure needs and industrial needs to, to the extent we need it. And that's why we said it makes sense to team up and address several challenges in, in, in this area. Next slide. So um, we have more and more devices. They are connected. We have similar software components and we have these industrial IoT requirements. And um, we started from a world where we really have a lot of different flavors and uh, versions uh, of the operating system out there. So every company, and it was actually even worse, every 
every unit in a company was maintaining their own uh, Linux flavor. And um, uh, this, of course, increased the maintenance effort a lot. Uh, and uh, so that's why we said uh, we need a common solution for these base building blocks team up to achieve a better quality, a better sustainability. Um, and also, of course, uh, to, uh, to, to share the costs of doing this. So the next slide, please. Yeah, that's uh, why we said we need a base layer. Uh, and we start with the operating system. And uh, in more detail, we started actually with a, the with a Linux kernel. Uh, and on top of this, uh, we want to build our own flavors. Of course, there are still flavors for the different domains, but the common parts are getting more and more. Next slide. So how does this look like? So we have a typical Linux distri distribution of hundreds of packages. And um, we started with the Linux kernel uh, because that's also something uh, we can handle in the setup. And uh, we are extending step-by-step step, uh, to add some more packages, which are kind of the least common denominator of what everybody needs to build a company specific uh, operating system uh, plus extensions. Next slide. Okay, and if we zoom out, it looks basically like this. So uh, we have the open source world on the left uh, and the company world on the right side. Uh, so uh, we, we have CIP as a base uh, have the domain specific and company spe specific extensions on top. And that's what we would call an internal distribution. And um, by doing this, uh, we achieve also um, a harmonization inside the companies to, to build on the same software stack, to use the same tools, to use the same software uh, testing infrastructure. Uh, but Yoshi will come to this uh, later. Okay, so looking at the timeline, uh, we said we are at the moment targeting the 10 years plus a scope. Uh, so um, this shows a little bit already how we do this. So we are closely aligned to Debian uh, and the Debian long-term support. Uh, what we are adding is the hardware support uh, for, for, for the embedded platforms we need to support. Uh, that's basically decided by the member companies. Uh, and uh, so uh, we continue to do the security fixes and to a certain extent uh, backports of new features. We'll come to that later. Next slide. So for those of you who are not familiar to how open source efforts are organized, uh, just a rough overview. So we have a bunch of companies on the top. So uh, here you see also who is already um, participating here. And um, these companies uh, provide, uh, of course, people who are driving this, otherwise it's not working. Uh, and they are also providing uh, a budget. And uh, with this budget, we can then fund additional people. So to ensure really the, 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 the sustainable of the development team itself. But what we also do, and um, Yoshi will talk about the upstream first uh, strategy also, um, we are also pushing activities or funding activities in other open source projects. Uh, which are part of our software stack at the end. So we try to not reinvent the wheel uh, and uh, we, we try to wherever possible to build on existing open source activities and extend them by the needs uh, of civil infrastructure products and industry products. Next slide. Okay. So uh, from now on, uh, I direct to uh, 
yeah, ex uh, explain uh, how we are uh, working for uh, ensuring the CIP base layer to uh, establish the sustainable products. And this is our, our scope of activities. So each box uh, shows some uh, technical uh, topics. And there, are, as you can see here, uh, there are a lot of topics uh, we need to uh, ensure to make a sustainable product. And as we have a limited uh, number of companies, we decided to define some priorities uh, for each technical topic. And our first and most important technical topic was uh, super long term supported kernels. And so, because uh, we, our first focus is, uh, yeah, we have to uh, establish a base layer. And in the bottom, uh, Linux kernel is there. That's why we started from the super long term support kernels. Then uh, we extend our activities. Uh, to real time and CIP core and testing and security and so on. So, and, and this is a CIP governance structure. Uh, we have a governing board uh, members uh, to decide uh, some strategies for CIP. And, and, and as a governing board, uh, we have a steering committee. So, steering a te technical steering committee uh, decide uh, some technical directions uh, for, to ensure our CIP base layer. So this is why now we have six activities. And uh, the first one is a uh, kind of team. So uh, SLTS kernel team uh, ensuring the maintenance for the uh, super long term supported kernels for 10 years and adding some embedded requirements to support, for example, some hardware packages and also uh, some functionalities for the security and so on. And the next one is real time. Real time is also related to the kernel activities. Real time patch is currently not upstreamed. So we joined the real time Linux project and also work together to ensuring the real-time patch to be upstreamed. The third one is CIP core. CIP core is uh, focusing on uh, to establish uh, our uh, base layer uh, for the user land. And uh, the fourth one is testing. So testing is important because uh, um, without testing, uh, no one uh, trusts uh, our base layer is okay or not. So we uh, develop a continuously integration testing environment. And uh, uh, we also open up the all test results to the public. So this activity is also working with the uh, kernel CI as an upstream project. And fifth one is security working group. A security working group uh, try to uh, they're working on the security extensions uh, to meet some uh, industrial technical requirement. And currently, uh, we are working on the tech, uh, security standard IEC 62443. And this is a, a one of the most important security standard. And the last one is software update working group. So this working group also uh, working for the uh, um, a connected uh, world. Uh, now, uh, industry uh, devices are connected uh, to provide uh, some features for the uh, infrastructures. And if we cannot update the software on the devices, that cause a serious effect, serious problem uh, for our life. So software update is also a quite important topic for us. And today uh, we have uh, yeah, two presentations from uh, CIP kernel team and testing team, and and also the other presentations presented for the uh, CIP security working group activities. 
So our principal is uh, upstream first. So we uh, once uh, we decide to uh, start some technical topics, we at first uh, we try to find some uh, upstream project. And once we have a upstream project, we decide to contribute first to the upstream. Then I use the upstream code inside the CIP project. This is how we are ensuring the CIP open source base layer. And I'd like to skip uh, some of the slides, uh, but uh, yeah, I really would like to mention about the CIP kernel team. So now uh, CIP have a uh, CIP kernel team to ensure the uh, CIP super long-term stable kernel. And our team is quite great performance and, and also experienced people are uh, joined and working with uh, upstream and also upstream stable uh, kernel team. So this is uh, how uh, we uh, work together with upstream project. And currently uh, there are four kernels and the details will be presented by uh, Kudo-san. And for the CIP core is a yeah, implement, difference implementation for the base layer. And now we have two profiles and tiny profile and generic profile. So tiny profile using for the uh, CIP base layer for small IoT devices. And generic profile uh, using for the uh, IoT gateways uh, that, uh, that will have more functionality on it. So uh, we collaborated with Debian uh, to ensure the uh, CIP uh, core reference implementations because uh, Debian also have a long-term support project and also extended long-term support project. So at the beginning, we started to join LTS project and then uh, extended to join to the Debian extended LTS project uh, from this year. And uh, currently uh, CIP core also working a lot uh, to enhance our CIP core packages on, and also functionalities. For the generic profile, uh, we have either CIP core and we currently focusing on to create a uh, testing uh, environment, and uh, we kind of recently added a LTP to the layer that makes uh, more easily to test a uh, kernel with LTP. And for tiny profile, uh, we added new board. We actually have uh, some reference board, but this new board uh, not only includes reference board, but also a reference board candidates. So we develop uh, yeah, lots in this area. And for security, uh, we also develop a security layer for either CIP core. And during these implementations, we find some uh, issues uh, for the Lava. And Lava is also an upstream project for our testing activities. So we decided to upstream this kind of uh, patches. So this is how we are working on the uh, CIP core. And CIP testing will be present soon. And security working group also uh, present in this uh, mini summit. So yeah, for software update, um, this goal incorporate a common solution for software update into CIP core. So that means uh, this software update uh, try to working with uh, CIP core packages to deploy uh, base layer images and also uh, to act a uh, safe update. And we created some demonstrations uh, recently uh, to show uh, how uh, CIP base layer uh, update uh, more secure and more safe. All source code uh, is now available on GitLab. So you can find uh, these uh, implementations on uh, the CIP GitLab and also informations available on the CIP Wiki site. 
So let me summarize our presentations. Uh, we provide uh, to uh, for the CIP base layer, and we are currently working with uh, six working groups, and each working group focusing on the uh, our key issues uh, for the security, sustainability, and uh, so on. So. Uh, to conclude uh, these uh, uh, presentations, our civilizations need open source base layer. So CIP will provide this using Linux. And everyone, if everyone using Linux, uh, CIP is uh, one of the most important candidates to use uh, it on, the, on your embedded systems. And we make sure to, uh, yeah, to ensure the sustainability uh, by uh, not only using uh, yeah, open source uh, code, we also uh, providing uh, some contributions to upstream project to realize our uh, open source space layer, which means a contribution and collaboration with upstream is key activities for CIP. So let me switch to Earth for the rest of presentations. Hi, Earth. Sorry, oh. second mute button. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for handing over, um, and um, yeah, we hope you have a, a good overview uh, what what is going on at the moment. You see, uh, we have a list of respectable uh, hardware and software companies uh, already backing CIP, uh, and um, if you have products that have to be maintained for quite a long, which have uh, requirements like uh, real-time requirements, or you just uh, need robust, uh, a robust operating system and industrial grade Linux, uh, you should have a closer look at CIP. Uh, and we would be happy, of course, if other companies are joining this effort. So contact us. Uh, could you su switch to the next slide? So we have... Uh, different ways, uh, so you can contact us directly. Uh, it's even better to go via the mailing list. The CIP mailing list is mainly the technical uh, uh, mailing list. Uh, we have a Twitter feed, we have a website. Uh, we also have a wiki which summarizes some of the latest uh, informations. Uh, and of course, you, it's an open source project. You can look at the code, so go to GitLab uh, for, for a CIP project. Uh, and the, the kernel actually is hosted uh, on, on kernel.org. You see the URLs in the slides. So thank you. Um, yes, I don't know how we handle the questions. Uh, let me just look. Uh, maybe uh, you just post it, or is it possible to speak up on that platform? Do we have questions? So maybe not. If, if, if you have questions and don't want to ask at, at the moment, just contact us and uh, I'll ask later during this event. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, the next speaker is... Uh, Denish Kumar uh, from Toshiba and Kent Yoshida from Renaissance Electronics uh, to speak of CIP security uh, towards uh, achieving industry grade security. So please start your presentations. Okay, let me share the screen. Yeah, please. So thank you for attending this session. I'm Kent Yoshida from Renaissance Electronics Corporation. 
I'm in charge of first part of this session and Dinesh from Toshiba Software India will talk at second part of this session. We once explained our activities at the last CIP mini summit at OSS North America. And then security working group are continu continuing activities to achieve industrial grade security. Today, we will explain an update about the activities we've done over this four months. In first session, I'll explain about the progress of our assessment with the certification body accredited by IC Secure Certification Program. In second session, Dinesh will explain about details of our development and testing environment. In addition, what we are actually doing to meet the requirements. To repeat for those who are listening our presentation at the first time, Security Working Group's mission is to provide open source based layer needed for developing products compliant with IEC 6443 certification security requirements. To achieve an industrial grade security, we focus on IEC 6443 certification as an international standard for industrial automation and control system. More product suppliers who develop using Linux and package software acting on it will take advantage of our solutions and get IEC 6443 certification to make industry more secure. IEC 6443 was born by integrating the standards of major industries. In addition, IEC 6443 is a standard series for all control system players. For operators, building a secure supply chain with reliable equipment is very important. To keep their control system secure, system and components that built in a control system need to be implemented with secure development process. And of course, its security features should be measured by latest cybersecurity. IC 6443 series is an international standard based on a certification program to ensure that industrial security is constantly updated considered by IEC and ISA as well. This is the reason why we focus this certification and standard. As you know, Linux is running on many components for industrial automation and control system field. In IEC 6443, requirements for components and their suppliers are defined, defined in part four. It means for dash one requirements for development process and for dash two requirements for security features of the component products for IHCS. Among them, the scope we are trying to cover is embedded devices and network devices. Since these devices are required to realize specific functions with a small amount, amount of resources, Software optimization is always an important consideration. However, IC 6443 Part 4 is a product level certification and does not specify platform requirements or commonly used open source rules. Now we are about half position in our milestone. So far, we have internally investigated the standards selected about 20 packages that are essential to meet the standard and how much CIP can achieve for the items required as a secure development process. And contracted with Exida, which is one of the accredited certification body for ISS secure certification program, then proceeded that gap assessment of CIP capabilities against IEC 6043-4-1 and Dash four dash two. This month, we completed the gap assessment for development process requirements and started the gap assessment for security feature requirements. The gap assessment defines how our project should address the challenges that should be addressed to meet requirements before the actual final certification. As you can imagine, 
of course, it will be difficult for open source development to meet all of the secure development process requirements for certification. This is a general development life cycle to be considered when we get certified for IEC 6443-4-1. We should define roles and identification of responsibilities for whom relevant with each development phase before starting development. Need to consider which environment shall be used for development and if that environment ensure protection from tampering or unauthorized use. Even in the other phases, various challenges are required. In requirement definition, what threats are assumed for the security features? In design, where is the product placed? Place it. How does it provide defense in depth? And what is best practice for it? In implementation, all challenges of source code are reviewed by who or analyzed using static analysis tool? Is it conducted a test to ensure mitigating the specific threats? How about a fuzz or a penetration test? Did anyone other than the designer run those tests? In addition, those measures are improved continuously. Finally, those definitions are documented. Although open source is designed with sufficient security in mind, there are many process challenges that open source project does not address that need to be considered to minimize risk. But among them, there are some tasks that can be addressed by open source development project. The key point is how product suppliers control those tasks and mitigate the risk of the final product. For that, we should show how far the platform can address those works and what the user must deal with concretely. For example, by defining a snapshot of stable version package lists and controlling version of it, and if we conduct vulnerability and risk assessment of them, users will be able to reuse them or easily manage the configuration changes based on them. Thread modeling depends on use case, so it's difficult to define all of them. But at least we can create a threat model for generic requirements, and then users can reuse it as basis. By defining the features that the security package considered by CIP Security Working Group, the features that must be implemented by the user application will be clear. By defining the open interfaces implemented in the security packages and the appropriate configuration example, it is useful as a generic use case. When integration of security packages as a reference design, we can apply static analysis tool and report its results. And its reference design should be tested periodically. And we can check its vulnerabilities at cyclic periods. Users can use the report as a starting point to consider additional tests such as fuzz or penetration. Those definitions should be documented. So here is the document list that are, we are preparing to meet IEC 6443-4-1 secure development process. Before conducting a final certification, we need to complete to create documents listed here. Those documents will be published on the GitLab repository on the CIP project. After completion of this activity, users can reuse those documents for user certification as well, because those documents are required also user certification. We believe it may accelerate this certification program. In parallel with rule definition and documentation, we currently are working on the gap assessment for security functions of essential packages using IEC 6443-4-2. About 20 packages we selected will be effective for many requirements. 
hold the entire requirement of IEC 6443-2. The challenges that the user applications need to be addressed are clarified by the certification result. In addition, how to use the package is very important to keep secure the products. Appropriate configuration of the package should also be defined and documented, documented through this certification. And of course, our certification results and evidences such as an assessment report can also be reused by users. This slide shows the flow, how security packages are suggested, implemented, and tested. The security packages are considered by the security working group, and then the security working group suggests those packages to Shapi core team. Shapi core team familiar with the package software, thus double check of package selection is carried out here. The software reference design that's implemented in combination with the super long-term support kernel is implemented on the Shapi reference hardware and validated on Lava Lab. IC 6443-2 has also security requirements that the hardware must meet in order to comply with security level three. The target of the assessment that we are working on now is software and the compliance of those hardware requirements should be handled by each reference hardware provider. In this way, if the hardware, corner, and even the core packages that runs in the user space, user space confirm to meet security requirements for IEC 6443-2, it can be said that it is the best platform for user product development to meet certification. So thank you for listening to my talk. From here, Dinesh will report more detailed implementation and testing progress. I'll stop uh, sharing a screen and pass to Dinesh. Dinesh, please share your screen. Sure, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, so uh, now onwards, I will explain about the status of activities as part of uh, security work group we are doing. So as uh, explained uh, by Kent, uh, there are certain requirements from IEC 62443 RS4-2, which is uh, in terms of technical requirements to add the technical uh, security capabilities in the products. So uh, first of all, the main requirement uh, which we understood from certification body was to define the uh, security requirements. So uh, after having internal discussion, uh, we decided that as of now, we will uh, take the reference of IEC 62443-4-2 security requirements. And on top of that, we will define CIP security requirements. So recently uh, we have uh, completed defining a draft security requirements for CIP and they have been documented and published and kept in CIP uh, pub documents public repository and anyone can access uh, the security requirements. So as we can see here, uh, we uh, have defined the security requirements and each requirement has one ID which will be used for uh, mapping uh, requirements like uh, for each test case or how, uh, like which package is used to meet that requirement. So uh, for meeting these requirements, basically we identified and investigated few Debian packages and we have already added those Debian packages. We will see the detail in further slides. So uh, this is the security layer added in CIP core ESER, uh, also called generic profile. So here, as you can see, uh, we have added a security layer uh, and as part of the security layer, there have been, uh, um, there uh, we have added the uh, recipe, which includes all the security packages. 
and also in addition to that we have added the security configs such as uh, customizing a uh, configs like uh, password strength uh, or other security measures which can be further uh, modified so uh, this has been already completed and integrated in cip core user main branch and it's already available in the gitlab so anyone can have a look on the uh, security packages which have been added as part of uh, cip security requirements uh, similarly we have added security layer in a uh, tiny profile where uh, you can see we have added another meta layer for cip security which adds all the security packages which we have identified while investigating ford s2 uh, specification and you can see here uh, in debi there is a slightly different way of uh, doing the security config changes so here you can see for each package there is one folder and inside that folder there is one uh, file which can be uh, used to modify the default configuration so in both uh, profiles tiny and generic profile the addition of security layer is completed as of now and currently as we are also reviewing a uh, 4s2 uh, specification with exida so uh, there are few comments and we may have to slightly make some changes in order to completely meet the requirements based on exida comments and uh, while adding the security packages as of now we have defined certain default security configs like enforcing a strong password uh, currently we have taken the reference from nist uh, how to uh, define the password strength similarly lock user accounts after configured or uh, failed login attempts uh, so these uh, default security configs can be changed as i already explained in previous slides uh so let's see next so how the uh cip uh, security test images can be created for eser and debi profile so this is the way all the source code is already available in gitlab so we already tested uh, security packages and their test cases already verified we'll see the uh, results in further slides this is about uh, cip debi where uh, we have also completed adding all the security packages so after adding all the security packages uh, we developed uh, lava test definitions and by automating uh, all the uh, lava test definitions we have verified how our security uh, requirement tests are passing so first we did a local lava setup as part of the setup we have to keep our lava test definition somewhere in git server and uh, we are keeping cip images as of now in aws so uh, these uh, lava scripts uh, take lava test definitions and cip images and automate this process of doing the testing and publishing the result and the results can be seen in the ui so even though this image depicts the setup for local setup but we have also completed this activity in cip lava infrastructure and we faced uh, some difficult issues which took a lot of time while doing uh, lava multi node test and as part of our investigation we found some issues uh, the patch for those issues already submitted to lava, lava app stream and uh, once it is accepted it will be uh, again available in cip lava infrastructure so here we can see uh, our test results when we executed our lava test definition on single node uh, test so all the test cases which we have developed to meet uh, iec's afford us to requirements all the test cases are passed and these uh, test gels are available as part of uh, uh, lava jobs so uh, anyone can see the test gels and the detail of all the logs the test gels for uh, lava multi node also available and as you can see uh, each uh, id like tc_cr1.11 
so it uh, this id belongs to one security requirements in ic 62443 uh, 4-2 one security requirements so for each security requirement there are either one or more than one test cases to test the security requirement so all the test cases in multi node uh, case also passed and this entire thing is already available as part of CIP Lava infrastructure. Next, uh, to meet certain requirements in IEC standards, uh, there are requirements like before uh, making product releases, critical security fixes should be incorporated and made available to end user. Receiving notifications for security related issues. So uh, these are the requirements from IEC standards and we have to meet these requirements. To meet these requirements in CIP core, which is uh, user applications. Recently, we have started uh, working on this and we have developed uh, a CIP core SEC as uh, uh, it has a set of scripts on top of Debian's uh, tool uh, for uh, CV tra tracking CVs. So uh, this tool will help us to track uh, CVs and integrate the fixes in CIP core and uh, in the future, it, this entire process will be automated and we can then we can say that we are meeting this requirement by tracking all the CVs. I think in uh, uh, next session, you will see uh, how CVs are being tracked in CIP kernel. So I will skip the slide. So we can say in both CIP kernel and CIP core, now we, ca we are tracking CVs uh, and it has been automated. Okay, so this slide explains about uh, our recent activity which we have started doing threat modeling for CIP as a system. So there has been very detailed uh, discussion with certification body. How should we uh, do threat modeling for CIP since it has many uh, Debian packages and uh, in, entire thing is open. So how should we uh, identify the points from where threats uh, may emerge? Uh, so we found the input from uh, certification body that the threat modeling we can be done considering CIP as a system. And we can do the analysis of how external entities are interacting with CIP, what kind of data flows happening so considering general huge case, uh, we uh, recently we had a, a dedicated session on threat modeling for CIP, where we explained about how are we approaching threat modeling for CIP and what kind of activities we are doing. So in this slide, as you can see, this is the summary uh, based on the stride methodology of threat modeling how is spoofing, uh, tampering, reproduction uh, for these kind of threats, what all packages we have added in CIP. So I, I will not go in much detail as we are running short of time. So these packages have already been added and tested as we have already seen the test results in previous slides. So uh, this slide uh, explains like general advantages of using CIP uh, distribution as compared to other distributions. There might be a few things uh, also available in other distributions, but you can see here, a dedicated kernel maintainers for SLTS up to 10 years is available in CIP, which is generally not available in other dist distributions. And one of the unique uh, support in CIP, which we see IEC assist platform by accredited uh, certification body, and as, uh, as it was already explained, we have recently completed assessment, the gap assessment for 4-1. And uh, shortly we will complete the gap assessment for 4-2 as well. And then we will start working on a final uh, assessment for both 4-1 and 4-2. We are also closely monitoring CVs at uh, both user level as well as kernel level. And regularly integrating all the changes. Extended support from Debian ELTS for specific packages are based on specific uh, CIP member companies. And then uh, regular automated testing on multiple SOCs with published test results on kernel CI. So here, anyone 
can see our test results which are regularly uh, being uh, published and it's strong support from big players as it was already highlighted in previous slides uh, previous session also okay so from cip security work group perspective what would be the next uh, gap assessment for compliance with 4 days uh, uh, one so uh, four days one and four days two uh, so we are about to complete uh, gap assessment for both and then we will go for actual assessment and all this uh, final cip assessment uh, documents and test cases uh, scripts everything will be available to end users and i believe uh, this will be a uh, great help and it will greatly reduce the effort for uh, uh, get, getting end product certified. So uh, along with uh, our uh, uh, test cases or uh, test scripts, we are also developing uh, some guidelines which will help uh, end product owners to follow those guidelines and easily get their product certified. So all these documents will be available in CIP uh, documents repository. So usually there are open questions like once the product is certified, then how it can be maintained in long term. So currently we are discussing with the certification body and we will make sure that our uh, product remains compliant for long time. So for that we are collecting inputs and we will be uh, publishing all those inputs which will further help for end customers. So that's all about uh, a uh, security work group status update. I think I will pass the uh, control to Kudusan. Uh, Kudusan. Susan, uh, we can't hear your voice. Thanks very much for joining this session. This talk is about CIP kernel team activities. I'd like to talk how we are interacting with upstream projects in order to achieve our goals. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Masashi Kudo from Cybertrust Japan. I have worked in software industry for both IT and network for more than 30 years. And I'm currently acting as CIP kernel team chair. Upstream first is CIP's development principle. I'd like to start my talk with upstream first. CIP kernel team, follows this principle to work on tasks. In the next section, I'd like to share what we are doing and what we have accomplished so far. Then let's get started with upstream first. Here, two development models are pictured. The model on the left-hand side is own community model. The project with this model branches its base from upstream and evolves by its own. This model enables the project to ramp up quickly, but in the long run, it will be difficult to incorporate upstream patches into it due to conflicts. The model on the right-hand side is upstream first model. The project allows patch commits only if those patches are already in the upstream. It may take time to introduce a desired patch because the target patch should be accepted by the upstream at first. But this model eliminates the risk of conflicts. At the same time, the project can share its outputs with the upstream. Please take a look at this graph. It displays the gross trend of commit counts for each stable release. As you can see, a few hundred patches are committed to each stable release per month. This trend makes cherry picking quite difficult because CIP is aiming a long-term maintenance 
upstream first model is a desired approach. As explained so far, the upstream first principle is essential to achieve industrial requirements, especially in terms of long-term maintenance. We collaborate with upstream projects. Before using the outputs, we upstream what we have and don't keep them locally. By rotating upstreaming and using continuously, we are moving toward our goal. Here explains how CIP artifacts can be used by CIP users. CIP refers to source or binary packages in Debian. If you'd like to use Debian source packages, you can use Yoktpoki as a build system. CIP core packages contain tens of packages which may not be sufficient for the development of end products. So users can add necessary packages from Debian by writing recipes. Debian provides LTS, LTS maintenance and even extended LTS can be provided. So super long-term support, including user land packages, can take advantage of these maintenance frameworks. Then let's move on to the CIP kernel team activities. Primary goal of the CIP kernel team is to provide CIP SLTS kernels for 10 plus years by fixing versions to fulfill the required level of reliability, sustainability, and security. There are two kernel maintainers, one kernel mentor, and one kernel developer in the team. While we are highly motivated to work on the project, we don't think we can achieve the goal by ourselves only. We definitely rely on upstream project activities. The question is how to use the upstream outputs and how to work with upstream projects. So what does upstream first mean for the CIP kernel team? Our upstream is Linus main line and stable releases. By upstream first principle, only patches which are already in the main line or stable kernels are allowed to be incorporated into CIP kernel re releases. So CIP members proceed upstream their preferred code. And once the code is incorporated into the main line or stable kernels, the code is allowed to be backported into CIP kernels. On the other hand, the CIP kernel team takes actions from a different perspective. One of the CIP kernel team's objectives is to maintain CIP kernels safe and sound. For this objective, the team monitors stable releases carefully and contributes to the stable releases where needed. In general, patches are committed to the main line at first. Then they are backported to each stable kernel. However, by some reason, such backporting might not be done on some specific, specific stable kernels. It may be because such patches are irrelevant to them or because backporting is not trivial for such stable kernels due to the changes of implementations. The CIP kernel team reviews those patch status. If the team identifies some patches to be backported to some stable kernels, the team contributes to them. We are concerned about security patches as well. We check the status of the security patches by using open source tools. And if some patches are missing in stable releases, the team contributes to such stable releases as well. By incorporating necessary patches, the team releases CIP kernels based on upstream artifacts. This is the big picture of the kernel team activities and patch review, CV check, contributions, and kernel releases are four major tasks of the CIP kernel team. Now I'm going to elaborate those four tasks each by each in the following slides. The first task is patch review. The CIP kernel maintenance review patches, which are included in stable release candidates for 4.4 and 4.19, because CIP kernels are based on those releases. As a result of the review, if the team finds any issues, patch review comments are sent to the kernel mailing list directory. 
A black window on the right hand side is an example of such review comments. Review results are saved in the GitLab, and if the team identifies some patches should be backported, the team initiates the contribution process. The second task is CV check. For security fixes, the team follows a separate process by using CIP kernel sec, which was developed for this task. The CIP kernel sec gathers CV information from multiple sources, such as stable kernels, Debian kernel, and Ubuntu kernel. The kernel team focuses on maintaining the CV, CV affected in kernel 4.4 and 4.19, and may backport the specific CV commits to the stable kernel where appropriate. The CIP kernel sec provides simple graphic layouts as well as CLI interfaces. The users can get detailed information via those interfaces. It provides multiple information regarding kernel CVEs. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the purpose of the CIP kernel sec is to track the status of security issues identified by CVID. This tool is public and can be found in the GitLab under the CIP project. You can also reach it on the website via the QR code. The third task is contributions. There are two for the contributions. The first objective is to fill the gaps. As a result of patch reviews and CV check, we identify missing patches. Such patches are needed for CIP kernels to fulfill industrial grade requirements. So the team contributes them to upstream so that CIP kernels can be based on the stable kernels, which include those patches. The second objective is to give back. Because we take advantage of upstream outputs, we are grateful for upstream activities. Therefore, CIP kernel team works on contributions of bug fixes and security patches to all stable kernels, not limiting to 4.4 or 4.19. These statistics show the counts of the contributions by the CIP kernel team to stable releases. I reported the statistics at ELC North America 2020 in June. Since then, the team keeps contributing to all stable releases, as you can see here. Compared with June timeframe, the team added nearly 100 contributions in total. The last but not the least task is CIP kernel release. Again, one of the CIP kernel team's objectives is to maintain CIP kernels safe and sound. Through stable patch review, the team identifies missing patches and contributes them to stable kernels. Also, CIP members want to backport their preferred patches. They send patches to CIP dev mailing list for CIP kernel maintenance review. By incorporating acknowledged patches, the testing team starts testing. After everything goes well, the maintainer in charge tags it as a release candidate. Another maintainer checks and acknowledges it. Then the CIP kernel is released. The announcement of the release is sent out to CIP dev mailing list. So by subscribing the CIP dev, you are notified of the CIP releases. As I mentioned already, CIP SLTS kernels are based on 4.4 and 4.19 stable releases. The first releases of 4.4 and 4.4 RT were done in 2017. We plan to maintain them to 2027 for 10 years. The first releases of 4.19 and 4.19 RT were done in 2019. And likewise, we support them for 10 years until 2029. Currently, 4.4 is released once a month. 4.4 RT is once every two months because commit counts for 4.4 are decreasing. 4.19 is twice a month and 4.19 RT is once every two months, respectively. So far, we have steadily released kernels thanks to our maintainers by following release 
frequencies I just explained. I also reported the release statistics at ELC North America 2020. Compared with those in June, the team made 20 additional releases and year total so far is 46. Toward the end of this year, several releases will be added for sure. 4.4 and 4.19 stable releases are active and we are taking advantage of their outputs now. We intend to maintain CIP SLTS kernels for 10 years, while the lifespans of 4.4 and 4.19 stable kernels are both six years. So after they finish those main maintenance, the rest of years should be maintained by CIP. Because maintenance of 4.4 stable release will be finished in January 2022, CIP will start to maintain CIP 4.4 by ourselves. The CIP kernel team is discussing how to work on this. We have been relying on upstream developers and other stable contributors for their outputs now. CIP cannot rely on this after the end of stable release maintenance. So CIP kernel maintenance would review each other's work. The details are still being discussed and I hope we can share with you the plan at some event next year. Before closing my talk, I'd like to show information sources relating to CIP. This page talks about our weekly IRC meetings. It is open to everyone. Come talk to us on CIP channel at the meetings. This page talks about repositories on GitLab. Links to open source tools, including CIP kernel sec, are here. The testing team's links are here. And other inf information is listed here. That's all. Thanks for your time to join this talk. Are there any questions? OK, thank you very much for watching my video. So if you have questions later on, uh, please send us email. So let's move on. The next speaker is Min Tran San from Runesas Design Vietnam. So Min San, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, um, I'm Minh from Renaissance and uh, now I would like to share my experiences integrating the CAB SLTS kernel into a fully flash VSB. And uh, here is the agenda. I will have uh, seven sections. The first is some introductions about me and my company. And the next some um, background information about our application view, our accessory platform, why uh, CAP is uh, suitable for us and the collaboration. And next is the main part. I will go through seven items of my experiences. And then some quick information for next step, Q&A, uh, thank you message and reference link. The first one is the introductions. Um, my name is Min and I'm a senior staff engineer from Minnesota Design Vietnam. Currently, I'm the leader in the Asset Linux team, and uh, we provide a verified Linux package integrating the CD SLTS kernel into the VSB. And I have 10 years experiences in embedded software development, mainly Linux, and last one in my contact email. And uh, about the main company, uh, Renaissance is Renaissance Semiconductor for Advanced Solutions. Our headquarters is in Tokyo, Japan, and we provide a platform for automotive, HMI, industrial, and IoT. Currently, we have more than 18,000 headcount. And um, for the major operations, we have the research, development, design, manufacturing, sales, and servicing of some semiconductor products. Renaissance uh, design Vietnam, Red RBC is a French company and we located in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. 
we measure in automotive and HMI with more than 800 employees. And we design for the semiconductor of software and hardware. For some background product, um, today I just want to mention about the uh, application field, human machine interface with 3D graphics and uh, video capabilities. For some example, like the uh, intercoms, the digital signage, and the kiosk terminals, and many more. And um, as this platform is our target product for above applications. Um, the first item I want to mention here is the uh, multimedia processor as it the platform is a family of 64 bit and 32 bit ARM based NPU and uh, with the specially in imagination 3D graphics and provide video processing up to 4K with many other concerns uh, necessary for HMI. We also have the evaluation kit and the very fine package that I will share more details. Next slide. We also have the uh, development tools and the software add-on would add uh, more optionals for the customer and make them easy to develop the product. For the HMI solutions, uh, we provide a Linux package with many um, components that apply the CMMI level three. We also have the industrial gray Linux we have the GUI framework, multimedia, secure middleware, and many samples. And we provide them verified and super long-term support. To satisfy this, CAB is our answer. It has the 10 or more years support, and so it's to take off our uh, target development. We already joined the CAB as a member, and we provide a, we uh, propose the reference platform. It's either SSD1 for the M7 and SSD2M for the MV3. And uh, there are also other reference platform from other members and totally seven. We cover x86, MV7 and MV8 architectures. Next, I will go to the main part, my experiences. The number one, we had to start first. The IDO development flow is from PD kernel team upstream to the mainline MTS. And I mean the CV kernel team here is the kernel team and also CV member and non-CV member who contribute to the upstream. And in this upstream work, it includes Renaissance patches. And then this mainline or FTS kernel will be used in the CV SLTS kernel and finally into integrate to the BSB. However, this is only the ideal development flow. In reality, to satisfy the on-time delivery, we have to start first. We integrate the CV SLTS kernel into our NSS BSB by ourselves. And we have to patch a lot for this work. However, we gradually get benefits. This is the number two experience. For the next update and super long-term maintenance, we part less, less and less because it now the IRO development flow development flow go into the reality. And we have the work reduced. For the first relay, we took for 15 main months. For the second, just 11, and gradually in the stable phase around seven main months. Even though the other uh, row number not real, but actually we had the reduced development cost. And it's been the number three, we continuously get the benefit. In the past, we have, whenever we patch the kernel, if we want to fix the bug, we have to stay investigate the reason why the solution. Now we can directly refer to the main line and the LTS patch to solve our similar issues. And not only us, for our customer, they can have the same benefit. And also to support the latest kernel, if they want, instead of self they can refer to the main line and LTS kernel and do this quickly. So we emphasize and our customers spend less effort to fix bugs or to support the latest kernel. Number four experience, we got a long-term benefit. For the first one, 
we Renaissance PhD team have the patch for our kernel and I call the new patch. Also CB kernel team have the patch for the same version of the CB kernel and I call export patch. We compare these two kernel and we can learn the difference and improve ourselves. We also try the mailing list to join or to monitor or to join the expert discussion about the kernel. And essentially, if any discussion related directly to Renaissance MPU, we can get involved more and get more benefits. We also have the chance to join many um, CD mini summit and other open source conference to learn about the expert discussion. And also I have the chance to speak here, to share my experience and to receive value feedback from you guys. So we have a lot of chance for the human development and we can learn and we can work with many experts. And experiment number five, we develop step by step. CB SLTS kernel have two versions, the normal and the real time. And we Renaissance want to support both. We don't have, we cannot support both at the same time, the same level. So we choose step by step. The first is verify normal version, and the next is just the patch for normal and verify for real time. And next one verify for normal and patch for real time and continuously like this. So we can stay with the fork bot, but step by step from easy to difficult and to stable phase. Number six is we support one version at one time. For example, in 2019, the latest DB SLTX version for had four different versions. However, to choose which version for us basically, we decide CB10 for 4.14 and CB66 for 4.4. To do to decide like this, we have the unified support. The only difference between the normal and the real-time is maybe just the real-time fast set. And the last one is we release once every three months. For the CV SLTS kernel, release 4.19 twice a month and 4.4 once a month. For real time, 4.19 twice a month and 4.4 once every two months. When we release one every three months, we always get the update from the latest CD kernel. And also we have enough time for one development cycle. We have six, around six weeks for POC, six weeks for verify and two for documentations. Even though number are very low because we don't spend much for kernel, it's included the whole development variety, but it's the, uh, enough time for one cycle. And um, that's all the experience I have, to sh I have time to share now. For the next step in the near future, we would like to integrate the call package. And we also want to expand the mode to cover that, the CV call package. And in the far future, we may consider the test donation, the security, or even more. And um, that's all for my presentation. If you have any QA, please give me. And uh, thank you for your time to um, attend my presentation. And also, finally, I have some reference links for you to refer for more details. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much the presentations and thank you very much for our speakers and uh, for this uh, CIP mini summit. So um, if you have any further questions and comment, uh, we have a mailing list, website, and also Slack channel and IRC. So please feel free to come our, our uh, information channels and ask any questions the CIP. So now it's time to close CIP mini summit. And I would like to uh, say everyone, uh, thank you very much. And yeah, hope to see you next time. So thank you very much and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very everyone. much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.
Bye-bye.